today on CityCast Boise. Happy Friday! Frankie Barnhill and Blake Hunter are here to help me sort through the week's news. We're digging into Nampa's new Don't Say Gay School policy, how remote workers moving to Boise could change our city, and why one year after Roe fell, Republicans are finding out what getting their way means. Plus, do we need to do a dance challenge? It's Friday, June 23rd. I'm Emma Arnold, and this is what Boise's talking about. Hi, Blake. Hi, Frankie. How was your week? Hey, Emma. Pretty good. We made it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's jump right in because we have this pretty big story out of Nampa that I want to talk about. Uh, The school board there just approved what is basically the 2C version of Florida's Don't Say Gay law. Blake, I know you've been following this in the Hey Boise newsletter, so why don't you give us the details? Yeah, so basically the Nampa school board just passed this on Monday on a three to one vote, um, which will essentially make it so that it's my understanding that any district staff Um, So teachers, but like other personnel as well, won't be able to talk about gender identity, sexual orientation. Um, And so on paper, what that means is that it's just restricting the speech, although, you know, it's not written that it's restricting speech Mm -hmm. of teachers and other staff and district staff and things like that. And not necessarily the students, but that if students come to them with that kind of conversation, wanting to have that kind of discussion, they will put them to you know a counselor who will then take that issue to their parent or legal guardian, guardian of whatever sort. And this is being referred to as Idaho's version of the Don't Say Gay bill because the general intent is to you know, restrict speech about queer and trans kids. This obviously isn't going to really apply to cis kids or, you know, to straight people. And so, yeah, this is the general intent is to restrict the teachers talking about this kind of thing. But of course, as parents and opponents were saying about this, people like kids aren't going to want to talk about this in general because this sends a message that this is not a safe discussion to have. And We'll get into what more parents were saying, too, but I just want to point out that, you know, a child might not want to go to a specific counselor. They might have a teacher that they trust more, and they specifically might not want this conversation be getting to be getting back to their parents. And, of course, parents are, you know, have the say at the end of the day, but there are lots of reasons and lots of, of worrying signs around this issue that a lot of people were bringing up in the testimony. Yeah, I uh, I watched a lot of the testimony and I thought it was interesting. And this is something that this really bothers me. I mean, you have open bigots, right? You have people who are just openly bigoted, but you have parents at some of these meetings and, um, you know, the the people who are sort of pushing this agenda who are saying like, hey, this isn't homophobic. This isn't transphobic. We just don't think this needs to be in schools. We just want to leave room for math and science curriculum. Like, we don't think that this stuff should be taught in schools. And um, and at the end of the day, like, I think that pisses me off (laughs) as much as the actual bigotry is this idea that you can absolutely be being a bigot 100 percent. And being like, no, we don't want, gay, you know, queer kids at school to feel safe, to feel like they can discuss their gender in class, to feel like they can discuss their sexuality. And to, to basically be like being gay or trans is something that's so wrong that kids shouldn't even know about it is bigoted. You're a bigot right. if you think that 100 yeah. percent. There's no fussing around that, in my opinion. And also, I think it's a little bit oblivious to just the way that we as humans, but especially children and teenagers think is that it's like, there's this idea that like, if they don't have to be worried about their teacher bringing up some trans issue in a math class, they'll be able to focus on math better. And it's like, (laughs) that is not how our brains work. That's not (laughs) how our teenagers work. (laughs) Absolutely not. And so, you know, it's, it's something that this is the worrying part to me as well is that this is something that uh, people are already thinking about and children are already thinking about and dealing with. And so any sort of effort to stifle that one is not going to work in in the way that, you know, people want it to. And two is is going to have really devastating consequences. 
Yeah. Yeah. One parent, um, you know, I want to talk about like what what the parents there yeah. were saying, because because it looked like it was about half and half to me. Do you feel like that's mm-hmm. fair uh, for people who testified? Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I would agree with that. And so, like, one of the parents I saw, she said she has a non-binary student at a high school. She said, this erases my child's reality. You know, are, is, she said, is my child going to be able to make art? Are they going to be able to talk about their gender? Right. Like, they, I feel like they think that the policy seems really cut and dry. Oh, you just you just can't talk about, you know, teachers can't talk about it. But, like, yeah. what about, I think of, I think of, like, the queer staff, you know, queer, totally. you have queer janitors, you have two, queer lunch uh, room people, you have queer administrators, queer teachers, like those people, those people are just their very existence yeah. violates this law. A teacher saying, oh, my husband, my, you know, a exactly. male teacher saying my husband and I went to blah, blah, blah. Totally. That's a violation of that person's like existence. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the supporters of this and the trustees who passed this would say, no, it's not. But the very fact that people will be asking themselves this question has the effect that it will stifle that. Yeah, Um, absolutely. And and, sorry to say it, that's the point. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And it can, you know, it always comes down to this. This is, I think, you know, everybody who listens to the program knows that I feel this way, but the idea that you're somehow grooming, uh, if you use the word groomer about queer people, you're a bigot. If you're using protect, I have, we have to protect yeah. children in language about talking about g- queer people existing, you're a bigot. Like, it's a dog whistle, yeah. This is a dog whistle, yeah. yeah. And it made me think, you know, something that kind of goes under the radar is that this policy actually has this component mm-hmm. uh, about the new bathroom law that goes into effect on July 1st, Blake, which yeah. I know you've reported on before, but this is a this is as big a deal as this policy. Absolutely. Um, and I will also say that this is the, the same school board that also preemptively banned several books last year um, from their libraries and you know, they this school board really is is pushing pretty hard in this direction. Um, but yeah, the specific bathroom law uh, is really worrying. Um, it, I mean, it feels very West Virginia 2017. You know, it's just a pretty a pretty simple, straightforward. We don't want trans kids to be able to go to the bathroom of their of their gender, and it's not quite worded like that. But that's essentially it. And there's this really interesting clause in there, and I say interesting with some trepidation. Is is that it says, you know, any any person who doesn't want to deal with that and doesn't want to go into the bathroom of the gender that they were uh, assigned at, or sex that they were assigned at birth doesn't have to necessarily, but they can ask for reasonable accommodations. And it does not lay out those reasonable accommodations very well. It's really unclear. And so, yeah, this is going to go into it in July 1st. So starting in the fall, this new policy will be in place unless something else shakes out, which I don't think it will. So, yeah, there's this this bathroom law, a bunch of the books that they banned, the majority of them were around queer and trans issues. And then this actual policy of being not being able to talk about gender identity and queerness in the classroom, it's it's a pretty dark time. Uh, it Can I just like. add in? There was one vote uh, that one person who voted against right. it yeah. on the on the board, and it was um, Mandy Simpson. She is actually a math teacher in the Boise School District, but she serves on the Nampa School Board, and she's very concerned as a teacher about what this could do for kids. And um, but what's fascinating, I just double checked her term expires December twenty twenty three. So. I'm curious to see, you know, will she will she run again? Will someone like her run again? Mm-hmm. Or is Nampa really turning the school district and the board um, really turning in this direction carte blanche, like all across the board? Or uh, yeah. will if another policy like this comes up, will there be somebody like her saying no, voting no against it? Right. Mm, yeah. I thought it was interesting, too. We saw again happening. Uh, Trustee Kirkman uh, did the same thing we saw a lot of in the legislature, which was, oh, I have a ton of problems with this. I think this is poorly written. I think right. we should, you know, I don't think that this is going to have the intended consequences. I think that this is not a good policy and then voted for it. And then like, votes for it. <laughs> oh, we've seen a lot of that this year. Oh, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> I gotta do it. Gonna do it. Well, yep. We'll be paying it. We'll keep an eye on that. And my heart goes out to uh, the Nampa Nampa staff and faculty that, that, that this is going to affect. And of course, the students as well.
Let's move on. I want to move on to this really interesting New York Times piece that I feel like has some very real ties to Boise and the growth we've seen over the last few years. Frankie, you sent me this, and it's all about what cities remote workers have moved to, which obviously Boise is a big part of that yes, conversation. Yes, yeah. And, you know, the headline, uh, if you just scroll at the top of the article, you know, they don't mention uh, Boise. It's like San Francisco, San Jose, New York, L.A., Austin, Denver, Portland. They're all on this main graph on the web on the article. But there is a way to look up the specific migration data and you can put in Boise and see that. And actually, Boise's patterns are very similar to a lot of the cities that saw an increase in remote workers during the pandemic. And so I think that's just fascinating that, yes, we're a much smaller city than some of these that are being talked about. But we also have seen relative to scale big change in our uh, who moved here and what kind of work they're doing and also, you know, what kind of jobs they hold, what kind of incomes they have and all of that. And we saw 6,000, to be precise, 6,000 remote workers move to Boise, according to this, between 2020, 2021. So those pandemic years, the height of COVID. And it, yeah, increased our remote workforce considerably from where it was before then. 6,000. So like, who are these people who moved here as remote workers? Do we know anything about them? Can we what can we reasonably assume? about? Yeah. So we know that uh, if you're a remote worker, you're more likely to be college educated. You're more likely to be a high income earner. And uh, many are working in tech, but not only tech, but, you know, tech is definitely an industry where we've seen a lot of remote work pop up. So those are a few things that we generally know about this group. Uh, We could probably also assume most of them are are white, given the the fact that they're more likely to be college educated and more likely to be higher income earners as well. How has this affected the housing market? Because like, I feel like we can pretty much blame <laughs> a lot of the crazy prices on higher income remote workers from out of state who moved here during yeah, COVID, Yeah, we all right? want to find one, one group to say, <laughs> you did this to us. Um, but, you know, to be fair, I think the answer is probably complicated, but I do think it's reasonable to say that the influx of remote workers who have jobs based in larger cities in higher income companies than exist in Boise um, or high pay- higher paying companies that that has caused our housing prices to jump up. Axios actually called us the poster child of pandemic real estate. That feels very apt. And (laughs) we did see that big jump in the median income of people buying homes between 2019 and 2021. So not the overall median income of Boiseans, but the median income of people specifically buying homes in that time frame, which would align with this influx of remote workers. So the median income of those folks went up by quarter, a quarter percent. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, and then, yeah. uh, but on the other hand, home prices in that same time frame went up by 50%. So even still, the home prices way exceeded the the median income of the folks who were even looking to buy at that time and trying to buy. And so, yeah, I mean, higher income remote workers moving to Boise for a better life, like that's the vibe. Um, and they've changed the city's economy probably in ways that we won't know the extent to 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 which that's happened for probably a couple decades. That's, of course, assuming that they're going to stay in Boise, right, after after COVID yeah, has yeah. receded and, you know, maybe companies that uh, were OK with their folks moving to little old Boise might want them back in their big city headquarters. Yeah, I think of uh, it's funny that pulls me sort of back to that Nampa trustee or the school board meeting, because a couple of the parents in there said, like, we moved from California seven months ago. And, you know, this is exactly the reason we moved is to, you know, because we don't want gay people in the schools, you know, like they came here thinking it was this conservative, you know, bastion and then got to Boise and like, I'm going to bring him up. But one of my neighbors They moved here from the Bay Area. They bought the house next to us for half a million dollars, which seemed super cheap to them moving from the Bay Area. They had sold their house for way more than that. Bought here, thought it was super cheap. They have two kids, school age kids, um, and they're already kind of talking about moving. Really? Like, I think. Interesting. Yeah, they're I think that they were surprised. They were like, it's smoky. It's hot. The politics are bananas here. Like. 
Uh, nothing is open after 9 p.m. It's the yeah. usual California Things aren't open on Sundays. Story. Yeah, yeah. I came to paradise and it <laughs> sucks. So Yeah, uh, <laughs> and I guess uh, there's this, you know, kind of maybe protect, potentially different groups that you're talking about, like the people who are in favor of the, the uh, you know, so-called don't say gay bill in Nampa might be different from your neighbor who moved here from the Bay Area as far as their politics alignment. But mm-hmm. I think, again, it'll take a little while for us to suss out exactly, you know, if this is changing the politics of Boise versus the politics of the metro overall. Towns like Nampo, where people are moving to, maybe because they're more politically conservative. And yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. like Amazon, let's just take Amazon. They want to bring workers back to uh, headquarters in Seattle, and they are really, really pushing it. There's been a lot of protests and, and pushback, of course. But, you know, the pendulum seems to kind of be swaying more toward what the companies want these days in recent in recent months with tech layoffs and stuff. So they have some leverage uh, to bring people back. So will we see some of these Boise, you know, newer Boiseans decide to have to move back to those big cities that they left? Or will they like get a job that's based in Boise instead or start a company in Boise? I, so many questions, so many things to keep watching with this. But no question, like the demographics of our city have changed pretty significantly in the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of terrible politics, it's been a year since Roe was overturned. And uh, NPR actually just did this poll, which included data on women who live in small cities like Boise and how they feel about the SCOTUS decision. And they found that 66 percent of women who live in small cities oppose the decision. What do we think, you two? I mean, I did think that stat was interesting because I'm like, small city sounds like Boise. Mm-hmm. Um 66% of women who live in small cities opposed. I I feel like that sounds about right to me, but I guess we do have, yeah. you know, nonpartisan city elections coming up this year, which will be kind of the first time to get a gauge, uh, I guess, after the midterms, which, of course, we didn't see our statewide officials swing to the left um, in the fall. I don't know. I think that actually, I mean, I think that it's taking some time, as expected, to kind of settle out the affairs of like what the abortion healthcare landscape looks like post row because you know it's just taken for example in Idaho but in in you know many other states it's taken quite a while to settle out the different trigger bans in court you know it's taken a while for things to come into effect um, people have turned largely to mifepristone and different like abortion pills abortion, medicated abortion uh, or medication abortion I should say and so Yeah, I don't know. I think that this is something that we are maybe still learning the effects of. We're still maybe not in the full swing of it. And yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it's pretty incredible that it was a year ago. It's like, I I kind of can't believe that. And also, oh, it feels like it's been so long just in this, in this, in the timeline of this story. It feels like, I don't know. Yeah, we are just definitely firmly on the other side of Roe, which is pretty incredible thinking of how long it stood. It's so interesting to me to watch, like, especially since we're here in Idaho and getting like we really have like the most restrictive abortion laws uh, or at least one of. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to watch, you know, these conservative groups get exactly what they want. It kind of makes me think of how like. Sometimes in parenting, you have to kind of let natural consequences uh, <laughs> take take their toll, you know, where like my kid once was like, I'm going to eat all of my Halloween candy. And I was like, you will get so sick if you do that. And he was like, no, I won't. I don't care. And I was like, OK. And he was like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. And he threw up tamales. And he threw up hot tamales later. So like, yeah. you know what I'm throw saying? Like, I feel like we're in the throwing up hot tamales Jeez. state of Rove being uh, done. Like. Like, because because you think about like Idaho pretty much like got every like the conservatives here yes. got everything they wanted as far as making it so abortion is very hard to access here. And, yeah. you know, and even last year pushing even further, like they're trying to figure out how can we wait a minute, you can't drive across the border anymore. You know, right. like they were pushing for really outrageous, really restrictive stuff and they got everything we wanted. And now we're in the find out phase of this. Right. Yeah. We're in the find out phase of being like, oh, wow. All of our OBGYNs are leaving the state, you know, right. like Bonner you know, General like, Health and Sandpoint closed yeah. down their delivery services in May. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting to be like, now that they have everything they want, I think that 66 percent 
will continue to grow even amongst conservative women who actually are watching finally the policy that they wanted play out and make it so young people aren't staying here to have babies. Hospitals are not no longer offering prenatal and, and right. maternal care. Like, yeah. I, I think we're we're really going to watch this play out to a point where I think we're, the Republicans have effed themselves on this one, honestly, because we're the poster child for getting everything you want and it actually being really terrible, like we've yeah. been saying the whole time. <laughs> and, and you know, it this kind of, again, ties back into the, the conversation about the Nampa School District decision is that there's this feeling of like, you know, someone, like you said, on, on the on the board saying, I don't really feel solid about this bill. I'm going to vote for it anyway. And that has happened with the abortion bills that Idaho has passed has been legislators are like, oh, my gosh, I didn't I didn't expect hospitals to shut down. It's like we told you they would. And also, Mm -hmm. you know, we are in the find out phase, but this disproportionately affects people who don't have the spare income to travel out of state. Obviously, that is being, you know, has been contested. They might not have the ability to purchase medication abortion. And so we are truly in the find out state. And I just I hope that I don't know real like I don't know. This is not realistic. And um, but I I just hope that it hurries up and and passes so that we can actually get to some real solutions. But I just don't think that that's going to happen. But I think that you're right that that number is going to grow. It's also interesting because once again, you see, I mean, it makes me think of the Ontario clinic, you know, that opened up in response to Idaho's restrictive abortion laws. Once again, Oregon stepping up, Washington stepping up to provide services and care to Idahoans. The people up in Bonners Ferry are driving across the border for to Spokane for maternal care. And once again, a state with a more progressive policy ends up like handling the issues here so that so that a certain group here can continue to pretend to be this conservative, you know, yeah. uh, paradise. So. Yeah, pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. And and you're right, Blake. It's important to remember that, like, really, truly low income people are so disproportionately affected by this. And, you know, there are groups like Northwest Abortion Access who can help people get uh, get across those state lines, get care. And there are groups. But it's still like that's a you don't have long to deal with that. You don't have no. long to deal with yeah. it. You know, yeah. so very the, scary. The rise of the the mutual aid this past year has been such a theme too. Um, we we knew, I mean these groups existed yeah. prior to it, but uh, really the turn to them is kind of the the place to go now. They're the front line of it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, let's end on a fun thing, Frankie. You said you have a fun thing. Thank God. Okay. Thank it's, God. It's... Pull us out of here. Well, I have Pull to um, give kudos to Evelyn, uh, our producer, Evelyn Vitia, for sharing this fantastic TikTok. So oh God, for yes. those who haven't seen oh it, it has gone uh, viral. Brenda Rodriguez from KTVB. She's amazing. And she got her colleagues, Justin Kaur, news dad, number one. We've had him on the podcast before. <laughs> Maggie O'Mara. Love Maggie so much. And our heart. Yes. And Jim Duthie, a meteorologist yeah. extraordinaire, to attempt to do the very trending Touch My Body Mariah Carey dance challenge. For people who haven't seen it, it's like it's a workplace <laughs> challenge. So, you know, they all they're coworkers. So basically, <laughs> Brenda tried to get them all to do this dance. And how did it go? Because I know that Emma, I know you and Blake, you both saw oh this. My God. What do you think? I think it went perfectly. Oh, it was so perfect. It was so great. I laughed (laughs) so hard. If you haven't seen the video, I really highly encourage you to find it. It's very easy to find. We'll link it. It is so cute and so fun. And I immediately got panicked (laughs) that Evelyn was going to make us do it. (laughs) I was like... Oh, no, please don't make us do this. But they are so cute and they nail it completely. And the comments on that video. Oh, my God. So funny. So amazing. I was cracking up so hard watching it last night. I love it. And they're just like on the set yes. of like one of the KTVB. Yeah, they got the green on screen in the, the back and everything. And it yeah. just, <laughs> it, yeah, it makes me so happy where it's just like, yeah, we need more of this. We need to just see people at work just hanging out. But yeah, I'm very, very glad that we work remote correct, so that Evelyn can make us do this. Yes. Yeah. Thank God for remote working. Uh, I have to tell you the comment that made me laugh the very, very hardest uh, is is somebody said um, about Jim Duthie in the back? Pops in the back went fishing limbo. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. That, if you haven't seen the video, that is the perfect yes. Jim love you. But that is literally yes. what you're doing. Incredible. 
He's just sort of freestyling. Looks back like there. they're fighting uh, the air. I think somebody <laughs> said. Um, Yellow tie is having the time of his life. That was Justin. Uh, Justin yeah. always, always having the yeah. time of his life. Yeah, <laughs> just fabulous. I'm, I'm appreciate that their newsroom did that, so we do not have to. Absolutely. So. <laughs> Thank you, KTBV. Correct. Thank you, guys. I love it so much. It's truly wholesome and really, really. I've, I've watched it a few times now, and the fact that it's, it's gone viral beyond uh, uh, folks who know KTVB or you know Idahoans who watch or grew up watching KTVB I, I love that so much I do too uh, KTVB we love you yes. please do more of those we think it's adorable Absolutely. Blake Frankie thank you so much for being here and helping me uh, figure out the week's news and um, I don't know maybe let's limber up sure huh? let's limber up maybe <laughs> yeah, we have okay. a dance challenge a in bit. our future <laughs> yeah a little bit <laughs> have a good weekend That's all for today here on CityCast Boise. The show was produced by Frankie Barnhill, Evelyn Avitia, Elizabeth Kama, and me, Emma Arnold. Blake Hunter writes our Hey Boise newsletter, and our music is by All the Kimonos and the local band Up Is The Down Is The. If you enjoyed our show today, leave us a review. It helps other people find us. We'll be back Monday with more stories from around the city. Bye. Sparkly doesn't want this answer out of you. <laughs> yeah, you know. they're censoring. They're censoring you.